Before we get on, can I just, who are, who are you? <laughs> just to get a bit of a feeling for what you guys are all about. Can you stick your hands up if you vaguely describe yourself as a designer or if you use designer in a longer description of what you do? And uh, what about, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's left? Are you more of a kind of engineering-y background? Uh, what, who, there's quite a lot of other hands. Is that just because uh, you, you? What about creative? Creative? Would you? And who, if people creative who doesn't consider themselves to be a designer? Is that possible? I don't know. We, we were discussing this before, and it's like you can't look at people anymore and know what they do, and you can't even ask them anymore. <laughs> so what, I don't know why I just went through that exercise. It's ridiculous. Um, so uh, yeah. So um, here to talk about risk and. Um, this is a reference to one of my favourite films in the 80s, early Tom Cruise. I recommend a view called Ris Risky Business. Very, very good movie. Um, I'm going to start right at, right, right at the sort of beginning, if you like, of, of, of my career to talk, about, to talk about creativity and risk and, and, and why that's an interesting, you know, the, the, the interesting words to put in the same sentence. So um, it's me at art school. I didn't dress like that every day, although, you know, I could rewrite history and pretend that I'd kind of dress like uh, Quentin Crisp. And um, you know, it was, it was sort of sexually ambiguous, but uh, but that was that was just a fancy dress party. Most of the time, in art school was was basically walking into a studio, walking into a, a big white box, um, and having to invent a problem to solve or a, or a, an idea that had kind of meaning and resonance, and then try to you know assimilate the stuff around you in the, in the studio or in the you know, in the, you know, the vicinity or whatever, to start to give that response a form, you know, start to manifest it in something. And if you think about all those, you know, you think about all those processes, it's actually, you know, it's incredibly kind of um, disarming and, uh, you know, difficult to, to, you know, to do that. We live in a world where, which is very, um, you know, we tend to sort of deal with very kind of known things and we can navigate ourselves on the basis of, existing knowledge and existing principles. And actually art school was, what, was something that really, really helped set me up. I mean, it, we still think about art education as this sort of funny kind of auxiliary thing that's about preparing artists. And, you know, when the economy is not doing well, then we don't really want it. When it's doing really well, then, yeah, we, you know, we have a, there's a place for art. And actually, I think it's really much more profound. It has an incredible role to play, and particularly in the times that we're in now. Um, you know, the people, the people who, can you hear louder? Yeah, the, you know, the people who did, you know, went to do sort of early multimedia courses, they might have learned the technology, but this thing really, you know, really set me up to, to deal with what I've really been dealing with since, which is exactly that, you know, come up with an idea that hasn't been done before, create something, um, which, which, is a, which is a real, you know, it's a real um, challenge and, of course, is inherently risky because something that hasn't existed before is not unknown and predictable reference, so... So it's, it's inherently risky. So I think that, you know, at, at the core of everything else I'll say, that's, that's really, that, that, you know, that continues, that, that you know, we are in a business and creating and inventing and innovating, doing anything new is inherently risky. So that's my, my, uh, my graduation uh, project to round that, that part off. This is, this is what, um, wait a minute, that's a different slide on there than there is on there. Something's happened. Ah! <laughs> it's a little bit of a delay. This is what, you know, this is what we're all scared of. And this is, this is Clive Sinclair. So, you know, he is a complete legend in the world of computing. And actually, some of the more senior people around here may have cut their teeth on the um, ZX81 or the, uh, the, the spectrum of kind of very early... Home computing in the, in the UK. I don't know if there's anything else. Commodore came slightly behind. 
So he was, he was a real you know, trailblazer and, and did some amazing things and had a profound effect on our, our, our nation's sort of computing heritage. Uh, and then decided to start getting into electric vehicles, which it basically didn't go very well for him. So this, this was the C, I think it's called the C5. And it, it, you know, it was on, it was, everybody was talking about it, and, but there was this rubbish. Um, and they failed and he was humiliated. So this is what we're scared of. You know, this is when, you know, when we stick our necks out and we say, actually, we can do this completely differently. And obviously, at the moment, we're caught up in this, in this world where you know, there's so many amazing things kind of you know, breaking and scaling and, and you know, are, are being successful and exiting and, you know, uh, what's it? Uh, oh, I can't remember, unicorning and all that stuff. Um, you know, but obviously, this is, this is the dark side of that. This is the kind of stick your neck out, do something awesome, scale the hell out of it, fall off a cliff, find a dark room, stay in that room. Um, There you go. Uh, so this is, um, does anybody know this, this, this lady? OK, good. I'm, this, I'm really adding some value to your lives now this morning. Just <laughs> with this slide alone, this, this, is, this has been worth turning up. So this is um, a woman called uh, Paola Antonelli, who is the design and architecture and sort of loosely technology curator at the MoMA in New York. Um, so she's been, um, she's been she put together some of the most kind of important and interesting shows that, that kind of bring together a lot of the, the, you know, the things that, you know, in our world with the, with the sort of more traditional design architecture and the, the, you know, the, the, those worlds and kind of collided them together in something really interesting. So she, she curated a show called Design and the, and the Elastic Mind uh, in, in MoMA about, uh, I think, seven, eight years ago, which is just an in, in, incredible show. Uh, and she continues to, you know, she, she, she's really one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting, curator uh, working globally. And obviously, the MoMA as a platform is, a, is, a, is an incredibly influential one in its own right. Anyway, this is her at South by um, last year, so two, 2015, I think. She, what she was talking about, I thought was really interesting, which is, you know, design, design gets more interesting when you're vulnerable. You know, when you allow vulnerability and, and, and you know, that openness. Um, and I think it's a real, and it really, it really touches the issue of risk because, you know, this is what happens when you stick your neck out. So that's what happens when things go bad. But at the same time, if you close yourself off and you only stick to what you know will work, then you're massively limiting the scope of possibilities. It's just as simple as that. It's not, you know, and it's not one or the other. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spectrum. And I think what, you know, Paula herself is, is uh, you know, lives by that um, lives by that mantra. So you know, the way she puts a show together, she doesn't she she's, she doesn't put, like put herself as the sole curator. It, it, they, 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 we 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 participated. We had Polk actually had some work in a, uh, this thing called Baker Tweet that we had in a show called Talk t uh, Talk to Me, which is about uh, designers, uh, engineers, and, and artists using technology to communicate in interesting you know interesting ways. So rather than Curating that show in a cl in kind of closed in a closed fashion, which most you know most curators are all up here and they're all geniuses and they're always kind of reinforcing their genius by saying, you know, I can't let you into the thinking, I sh can't show the working because, you know, that will erode your that will make me kind of fallible and questionable and that will let you see into what I'm doing. Instead, she actually opened the whole thing up, so you know, ran the whole curation project through a blog and and you know showed the short list, showed the long list, the short lists, the commentaries. And then slowly, kind of help people understand why you know why they arrived at the, the selection they did for the show, and she did that and co-credited her assistant, who who would otherwise have been completely hidden. So she kind of lives by those values, and I think it's really you know it, the consequence of all that. It just becomes so much richer. Um, and you know when you when you sort of you know when you think, well, what's the value of these shows? What's the value of these experiences? You know, when, you, when you think about the alternative, which is you walk into a gallery and you have no sense, this little texture to it, it's all so choreographed, versus you can kind of see through all this, you know, all this background, all of these decisions, all of these, all of these discussions and all these conversations. Suddenly, it get, brings the whole thing to life. It gives it new dimension, and it makes it much, much richer. So I think that's what she was, uh, that's what she was talking about. Uh, this is Jane. Have you had Jane? Have you had Jane speaking? You can check it. She's, she's just had a child, though, and she runs this 
incredible business. But she's quite local, so you might be able to get her for 20 minutes uh, one morning. But she's great. And, and, um, and I think just she's, she kind of follows on from that story really neatly because she, she like me, was a, you know, studied a sculpture. She, she found herself at the um, RCA, so she had a bit more of a kind of design interest. So she, she took a kind of design product, industrial design path. And um, I think, you know, hanging out with all these incredible, you know, if you get... I, her last name is really hard to pronounce. I'm not going to try and do it because... It... So she runs... So she's, she is, yeah, she's a Sugri founder. Yeah, it wasn't the best bit. I like the picture of her. This looks like she's more of a foodie. And that those are all like orange meatballs. But these are, these are all uh, Sugri. Um, does everybody know what Sugri is? It's amazing. Okay, it's amazing. There you go. Um, so she, you know, she was she was surrounded by these incredibly ambitious students. If you're at the RCA already, you've kind of, you know, you're you're a high achiever. Can you tell people what it is? Oh, so, okay. So it's it's uh, you know it's like it's kind of like um, uh, it's like silly putty and glue and blue tech it's sort of mashed up into one. You sort of form it, so it's a bit it's very plasticine, but then it then it then it hardens and it's an adhesive as well but it, re it retains its, its um, malleability. So it's an incredible substance for, fi you know, for fixing, for making, for all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, I'm not on a commission. Um, anyway, so she, when she was in college, she was around all these designers, and there was an incredible sort of sense that, that the whole thing was driving towards these individuals setting themselves up as kind of pedestalized artists and geniuses who, who, who's, who kind of operated per, as personal brands or they wanted to create kind of awesome, um, you know, products that were important, you know, and that, that, that manifested, uh, you know, the, 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 these dreams. And she was, like, uncomfortable with that. And, and uh, while she was kind of struggling with all these, all these sort of, you know, mega egos around her, she was playing around with this, uh, you know, this kind of substance she was developing, which was just silicon mixed with, with sawdust and, and, and stuff that she just found around the machine shop and started to, you know, use its malleability. And it had, it had a lot of these properties that Sugar ended up, you know, ended up with. Um, I was really excited about the idea of creating designs as enablers, you know, design that, that didn't have a form and didn't, didn't have a kind of story baked in, but were more things that, you know, that you allowed people to kind of, you know, invent their own stuff with. So actually taking, you know, sort of disrupting that, that, that idea of the traditional designer as being the kind of the auteur, you know, the, the definer and the, the master of something, to being more this kind of, you know, more step back and more, you know, I've done this stuff and now it's for you to invent what, you know, what it becomes. And, and, and you know, that, that gesture is a gesture of vulnerability. It's a gesture of saying, I don't have the answers. It's a gesture of saying that this, you know, this brand is not about an answer. This brand is a, is a, in a, is a question, in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of sounds very abstract, but you can see, you know, this is a business that's going great, you know, going brilliantly. And, and in 20 years' time, it will be on every single, you know, shelf in every single shop. Um, but it comes from, you know, the, the idea comes from that, that, that spirit and that, that spirit, you know, that spirit of openness and with it inherent risk because we're not supposed to operate like that. If we're great designers, we're supposed to have visions that, that are complete. Just to bring that home in a completely different way, I heard, heard this amazing um, interview on the radio and it was, it was talking about cancer and they were talking to a, a doctor who... You know, he regularly, you know, he was basically on the front line. He was the, he was the doctor who was delivering the prognosis. He was the doctor who was delivering people's results, which must be like the most intense situation you can imagine. You, you, have, you, you know, when you have a sort of moany meeting with a client, you probably think that's the, as bad as it gets. But these guys spend, you know, every day breaking terrible news. But what was interesting, what was really fascinating about what he was saying was, the palpable relief in people's faces when he told them that they had cancer, and when when the result was, you, I'm, af I'm afraid, you know, the diagnosis come back, you you know, you have cancer, and he's he's sort of surprised by that. And and the rationale, the reasoning, why he feels that that happens, or he, you know, he thinks it's he's pretty sure this is the case. It's just people would rather know bad news than not know. It's actually more painful. To, 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 be, to, be, to not know, you know, to not have the solutions, to be, to be sort of hung in, am I, aren't I? It's, too, it's more stressful and, 
than coming to terms with a reality, even if that reality is, is you know, I mean, personally, I'd rather 50-50 than, you know, 100%, but it just really is, is, is very interesting how, how kind of emotional this, this, this territory is. You know, we think about, when we hear about risk, we, we think about on more sort of binary terms that, you know, we've, we've got a 50% chance of this, or if this doesn't work, then that won't work. We think about it in that kind of causal uh, way, and, and often we're not really aware of the fact that a lot of this is, is really kind of deeply psychological, and it's very emotional, and a lot of it's to do with just fear of not knowing. And critically, as creative people who've been through art education, who walked into an empty room every day and had to figure out something to care about and something to, something to you know, question to answer, we're so used to that. It's, we, we, you know, that's really what we're doing, I think, in creative education when we're working creatively. We're developing that kind of that strength to be able to deal with ambiguity. But you forget that the rest of the world <laughs> hates it. You know, they break out into a sweat when they're faced with ambiguity, when they're faced with not knowing. I mean, in this example, it really, really brings that home. Just how much pressure that, that puts on people. Because I think as creative people, if we don't, if we don't acknowledge that, and we don't empathize with you know, our clients or our partners or whatever it is, you know, that's where the rub is. That's where we end up in those fucking clients. I never get what I'm, you know, they don't get me. This is brilliant work. Take a risk, come on. Um, so this is early, this is when I bowled out of art school, this is the first, first thing I got involved with, which was actually my entry into the, into the um, it's really dodgy, we had to video off screen because the technology is so completely incompatible now, the only way to actually get it is just pointing a video camera at a screen of a very old Mac. Um, but I'm not going to show you this, I'll just let it run, but, the, um, but this was a sort of experimental CD-ROM back in, um, uh, that we released in uh, 1995. And it actually came from a piece of arts, arts funding. Uh, so it was a group that, that came out of Westminster University, which was, which was just basically this really interesting uh, kind of uh, photographer and um, uh, critic uh, and uh, academic. Um, and he threw together a bunch of students. And the, the, the point of this, this, uh, this exercise was to say, you know, already kind of multimedia had been, everybody decided what it is and what it was for. This is basically CD-ROM, so it'll be before a lot of your time, but... Everybody, um, you know, suddenly computers, the, the processors and the power had, and the screen and all the sort of related technologies got to a point where you could basically play videos and look at pictures and stuff. And, uh, you know, only, only a couple of years before, that was completely out of the question. So, so it was a revolution and obviously, but everybody jumped on it. It was this enormous kind of commercial opportunity for publishing particularly to repurpose, you know, what, what were they putting out as books. Uh, particularly kind of encyclopedic stuff where there's a sort of visual dimension as well. It was like an obvious thing which multimedia computing is all about this. This is what it is. And obviously, because of economics and because of this, this sort of risk around not knowing, before the thing was even out of the gate, everybody decided what multimedia was and what rituals and what structures and what formats were the right formats, were credible formats for that, for that, um, you know, for that medium. And of course, we were sitting there going, wait a second, this hasn't even happened yet, and we've decided. So let's, why don't we just piss around with it? Why don't we just have some fun with it and try and do, you know, start where you should, where you should start with something new, which is at a sketch base, and just throw sketches together. Let's not try and, you know, at the time. And it still knocks about today. It's really interesting. I mean, I, I hear the, the, same, the same narrative again and again and again, which is, you know, the importance of stories and how, how you know, how we should use... Um, you know, multimedia to tell stories, and uh, anyway, it was it was very tiresome. But the thing, that, the, the the risk dimension to this was that we were the the arts council funding we got, which was about three thousand pounds, sat down and said, and that, that what that funding was was to write a proposal, to, so to research and write a proposal to make something. And we just thought, well, how much does it cost to print a thousand CD ROMs? And it was like fifteen hundred quid or two two grand at the time. It was bloody expensive. Uh, and um, so we just thought, let's just do it. Let's just make it. Let's, make the thi let's just make the thing instead of writing the paper. So in terms of that risk, that risk dimension, it was very interesting because, you, you know, we could have de-risked it by creating a very kind of strong, robust argument. But at the same time, what we would have lost is that, that um, intuitiveness and that, 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 that sort of... Uh, um, you know, that inspiration and that, that looseness that it had. 
by, by, you know, by giving it so much structure and by making arguments about the way that things should be and putting things in, in, in you know, academic terms, you would kind of limit the life that it had rather than, you know, rather than just banging it down and saying, this is the proposal. Um, so it was an interesting, it was an interesting start. Um, this is a, a Pope project which has been rolling for years and years and years. And um, you know, it was talking about how nearly everything I do is side projects. And the, the, the reason why it, it feels like that is because those are the ones I always show. Because the side projects are obviously the most interesting ones. The, ones, the things you're prepared to take your own risk on and develop yourself and, and you know, invest some of your own money in. The reason why you do those is because you know they're going to work. Obviously, when a client enters a room, when you're dealing with somebody else's project, you've got a lot of other, you've got a lot of other concerns to negotiate. You, you don't have free reign, and obviously you have enormous constraints because you have to achieve something very specific. So the risk profile is completely different. Um, but actually taking a risk and doing your own thing is, 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 is incredibly rich because then you don't have all that interference, um, which is why it's worth, you know, I think the best, you know, when, you, when I think about the people in the industry that I admire, people like, you know, us too, for instance, I'm sure you all know, you know, the reason why they've done so well is because they've, you know, they've balanced their own investments against their client work. And they've really, you know, they've really taken that seriously and understood that, you know, they can, if they can finance their own, their own stuff with, with um, you know, with the revenues generated from their client work, then they get the best of both worlds. They get a, a playground which they can, you know, really push things and develop their own sort of sensibilities and actually develop those, those skills in running those businesses, uh, whilst at the same time, you know, actually grounding their, their, uh, their disciplines on really robust, well-paying, uh, you know, well-paying client work. So it's been, the, it's been the same for us all the way through. Uh, this is this is very much like that anti rom work, and I think um, it's a bit back to what Paolo was talking about with with vulnerability. So in the industrial, you know, in the sort of industrial side of uh, um, the world. Um, so um, you know, in the product world, we have all of these same sort of uh, uh, kind of ego elements and pr sort of pride and. Uh, uh, Obviously, historically, when you, you know, a bit like that, what I was saying about Antirom getting the big proposal together, when you wanted to fund a product business historically, you'd have to go to, obviously, to great lengths to prove that it was viable. Uh, and, and absolutely, 100%, you would have to close the whole thing off and, and not tell anybody about it. If you're going through a patent process, you'd have to keep it all behind locked doors. So, 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 um, so you know, what, what the, the net result of that is you set the entry bar incredibly high. So you can only get a product, you know, if, you, if you follow those rules, you can only get a product to market if you go through this incredibly kind of uh, you know, uh, elaborate and, and you know, long and costly process to get to a point where you can actually release something. And obviously, you know, most of the time, you wouldn't even talk about it until it, was, until it hit the shelves. That's fine. If you're a massive corporation, it's it's just but for kind of individuals it doesn't work. And the other thing as well is about communication and how historically, you know, when you get the product to the shelf, then you want to talk to people about it. Then you have this other enormous um, endeavour which is about communication and marketing and media. Obviously, when you're paying, you know, you're kind of distributing this stuff through paid channels. That's that's in itself another huge, you know, sets another huge bar. So the cost to entry is enormous. Now. At the time we were doing it, you know, the time I started doing this thing, which so this picture was taken in 2002. Um, I just had this idea for, you know, big, putting big phones on little phones, you know, on, on mobile phones, because these, you know, this is my, my little Nokia thing. I can't remember what it is. And we were working for Orange. And so we were like, telco, telco, telco. Um, and I was just looking at all these things, and we were obviously in, involved in communica communicating about this technology and what's exciting about it. And at the same time, I was just looking at it, I think it's fucking ridiculous, you know. That it's getting, so, you know, everything's being, that they're shrinking, 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 because the whole hardware business is all about small, 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 and more and more functions. And, uh, you know, and the kind of graph that went like that, which is that sort of accessibility and utilization of those functions was actually going down, even though the functions were going up, and the usability of the devices was going down, because they're just getting too small. It's just like, what the, f this is ridiculous. So in a sort of artistic statement, a bit of a, like a Duchamp uh, moment, I just thought, well, you know, here's an well, rather than go and make a painting and stick something in a gallery, just like put something out as a product, bought this thing off eBay, rewired it uh, with a, with a hands-free kit, stuck it in a mobile phone, 
and then just went around in the around the streets with this thing. Um, so it cost you know it cost nothing. It cost like thirty quid to to you know to get to this get to this prototype. Um, so you know, in, in in our business, we obviously we talk about you know minim, minimum viable product, and that's exactly what this was. It was the least I could possibly have spent on it to to test it, and and not to not to sort of do it in a closed environment, and not to if you you know if I tried to write this down as a proposal, it would know, everybody would just laughed laughed at it. But actually, getting it out in the street and seeing people's reactions immediately within a, within within like two type, two trips, you just knew that this thing was would be successful. Because people's reactions were so strong. Again, back to psychology, it was like, it just, you know, you just put a big phone on an old mobile phone. It doesn't, you know, people don't, don't, it doesn't sound interesting. But when people saw it, it just completely touched them because they were all dealing with the same thing. You know, this kind of raging, you know, technology that was leaving them behind and them feeling alienated, basically. And they saw this thing and it kind of turned the whole thing on its head and made a joke of it. So in a really simple way, in a very sort of human way, and actually by not being in a gallery, it was much more powerful because it was a bit like, you know, this is this is sort of art out in the, uh, you know, out in the open, and people totally loved it. And then this thing, I sent that photo off to a to a um, uh, to a guy in uh, in Milan, and um, and then he he mailed me back the same day. I said, I stuck you on the front of my magazine. <laughs> and this is uh, yeah, so this is 2003. Um, do, do you know Depop? Does everybody know Depop? So the guy who runs ran that magazine set Depop up. So that's a sort of funny, uh, funny connection. Uh, Simon Beckerman, he's a fantastic, he's actually an industrial designer, media mogul now, entrepreneur. Um, and that was the sort of beginning of it. And then, then a few years later in 2005, we, we, you know, we, it got to the point where that funny little thing had sort of spread itself slowly. And I obviously set a site, I, you know, had a, I set a little blogger thing up, I had a 60 quid a year hosting set up, which I've you know, stuck some pictures up of different uh, handsets that I'd, I'd kind of rewired. And then had a, a whole page in the New York Times, and then lots and lots of phone calls, and then finally just you know, went out and got an egg loan and, uh, and went, went to find a factory in China. And then we made them, and, we, um, and then we, we started selling them. And we'd, you know, we sold like a million quid's worth and went bust in, in three years. But it was incredible, incredibly fun. Um, but the... the the, there's a there's sort of risk story in here, which is when we started that, we just knew that you know there was there was a, it kind of came from an art place, so it came from a sort of you know it, we, we were trying to make a sort of statement through a really fun this really fun kind of resonant uh, vehicle that people kind of got they didn't it was, they didn't get it critically they got it in their stomachs and their hearts you know which is which is even more powerful and obviously at that moment when we departed on this 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 journey it was like what do we want to do do we want to make it really cheap really accessible and sell absolute bucket loads and just sort of accept that, that, you know, that, that it will dissipate and it will go because it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a fun thing, but it's all about timing. Or do we try and create some equity? Do we, do we, do we try and make these things really nice quality, really you know, something that, that will last? Because a, a lot of the philosophy behind it, and actually the name Holger that we, 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 we launched these things under, came from my grandfather who had the same chair and the same phone for like 50 years, the same car, and they all had a sort of smell about them and they all took on his character because, you know, they, they and we used, to, we used to use this sort of phrase which is wear in, not wear out. So they actually improved over time when actually, you know, most products today are designed to, you know, to lose their appeal, lose their luster so that you want to replace them. So it was based on these kind of, uh, these ideas. So, so we had this kind of, you know, do we take that road or that road? And again, in any decision, you know, there's risk. We, you know, if, if we do that, we don't do that. If we do that, we don't do that. But what was interesting and what was great was, you know, we took that, we took that previous path and we, did, we lost the business. And we, you know, we made a million quid. The, the people who, the various copies probably generated between 50 and 100 million pounds worth of revenue. I mean, they were selling every, every single shop around the world. You'd, you know, every electrical shop, you'd see them and you'd see them, all, you know, all over the place. And every, you know, I think everybody got one for a Christmas present in the world at some point. Um, and we didn't, we didn't capture that. We didn't capture that uh, revenue, and you would say, you know, I, I think probably most people in the world, maybe maybe you guys are a bit cooler, but most people in the world would say you probably took the wrong, probably took the wrong turn there. Um, and um, but I would argue that by by making that decision, we 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 risk the capital side, but we de-risk the reputational side, and 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 actually, you know, having worked with brands for 20 years now since I left art school. I have enormous respect for the, the quality and value of 
of equity, of, of, of the, you know, the equity that, that people place on brands and the brands generate. If you think about Apple's success, it's, it's, you know, it's obviously it's a whole rack of independent, independent success stories all laddering up to you know, the, the, the huge uh, number in their bank account sitting offshore somewhere. Um, but it's a lot to do with that equity. It's a lot to do with the fact that you, you, know, you maintain a, a standard of quality and experience and you always take people forward. You always take them beyond expectation. You always deliver. And it's that sort of trajectory that creates this ridiculous kind of religious feeling that people have for that brand. So, so if, you're, you know, if, you want to, if you want your customers and markets and journalists and influence and stuff to, to follow you on a journey, you just have to maintain your standards and you can't do both. It's really as simple as that. I know, you know, in our world, my world, where I deal with a lot of clients, you know, the, the perennial frustration is with CMOs kind of going through a revolving door on a you know, 12 month, 18 month tenure. Nobody's thinking long term and nobody really cares about long term equity, which just makes it a real struggle. So, when we, when we, this was sort of 2007 when we did this project, which was the beginning of the light bulb. And actually, we had learned something from the phones, which is, yeah, the copies are going to come really fast. When you have a nice idea, the, the co you know, copy, copies happen really, really quick. So let's, how can we put an idea out there in the same open way? So we just put it out there in the world um, and, and, and still protect it. So we don't want to use the clandestine sort of protections of patents and whatnot, because that means you can't share it. And then obviously the chances are somebody will go out and, and take the idea. And what's important to us, by the way, is it selling this thing that we, don't, we haven't even produced yet? Or is it kind of creating a position in the marketplace to say, we're about this. This is our idea. And actually, that, that was the most important thing. And so the answer to it is just do something a bit crazy that, that China wouldn't understand. And even if they did it, it wouldn't work. It's really as simple as that. So, so we're actually just up the road on, um, on Commercial Street. We had a couple of interns in, gave them some coat hangers, gave them some ideas. And then three days later, took the nicest one down to a neon sign shop and said, can you make that? And then 150 quid later, we had this thing. And um, you can't quite see it there. This is actually from my launch pack. But that's a bottle. That's a bottle on top there. It's just a plastic bottle. You won't, you won't, you won't notice that. It's, it's, just, it's just sort of gubbins with a bottle over it. But the reason why that bottle was important is because we needed to kind of call it a light bulb. We needed it to look vaguely like a light bulb so we could, we could say that we made the first light bulb, even though it was really the first bit of neon. Um, but the important thing there is, oh, wait a minute. Um, you know, the critical thing there is it's, it's, you know, in terms of the risk profile of this whole project, it was really identifying what's the most important thing and, and trying to cut out all the other, all the, all the things, the extraneous things that didn't matter. We didn't have to make it real. We didn't, it didn't have to actually be a light bulb. It didn't actually have to be for sale. What was critical was that, that, that the community understood it as a light bulb and that it was posed as a light bulb project. And we didn't want to put it out as a sketch because it didn't, you know, it feeling real was really important. Um, so that was, you know, a couple, of, a couple of weeks later. This is a, you know, full page in the in the in the Times, uh, talking about, you know, talking about that uh, that light bulb. You know, because we pitched it high and we maintained a sort of standard, and and we, you know, we were always, you know, talking about these, these sort of high aims with with what we we're doing with Plume, which were really, you know, kind of a significant tension with the novelty aspect of, of of it. But what it meant, it kind of kept us in favour. So when we put a press release out about, oh, we doing this thing with lighting, um, people were supportive. It's as simple as that. So, so in terms of that transfer of equity, we had, a, you know, we had a kind of broken phone business, but we had a reputation, and we had the trust of people with influence who, who, um, you know, who could, um, oh, I don't know what's happening there. Um, you know, who, who we could leverage, basically. Uh, so, so, you know, it's very kind of abstract value, but it's value. Um, and, you know, as much about you know reputations, but also about just connections. So, every time we ever got a, um, a you know a bit of interest around the phones, we would obviously archive the contact. And the, you know anybody that's talked about us before, it's a warm <coughs> contact. So, so as those, as those databases build, then you know you just extend the network wider and wider. You know, um, and it's easy to pick up those conversations again. And actually, you think about you know you think about journalists and influencers. They kind of it's, it's, it excites them to be on a journey with you as well. You know, if you do something interesting the next time and they're, they're in a position to, you know, they've got a kind of access to that story for other people, that's great for them too. So it's, uh, you know, it's real, it's real value. 
So back to this sort of de-risking. It relates to the anti-ROM project that I showed you, the CD-ROM thing, which is, do you write a big report or do you do something? And actually, you know, because of the way the world is wired together, then actually doing something is, is really convincing in itself. So putting that out as a, as a prototype, put it, getting it in the Times, and obviously lots of people talking about it, means that, you know, had we have gone the other way and done it in a closed room, then we would have gone in to see manufacturers and said, we've done a bit of market analysis, and we think that's an opportunity. Uh, here's some drawings um, and a pattern or two that we've got, um, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, will you buy it off that? So, so, you know, very kind of, you know, rigid and prepared and, 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 and as de risk as possible through the sort of research and arguments that you, you'd prepare through those, that, you know, through that approach. Or, as we did, we go in with, here's a prototype and it's already in the Times and everybody's already talking about it. And by the way, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this that we haven't told anybody about. And that actually, this is a viable industrial product. This is totally unviable in market terms as well. Um, but this is a story, and this is reality. Um, but also, by the way, here's the phone story. We've done this already. Here's all the world's you know, most uh, credible press, and we're all over it. Um, we're going to do it again in lighting. So actually, you know, it was a completely different, completely different pitch. It was still very difficult. Um, and, and out of the 10 conversations we had, we, you know, we, we landed one conversation uh, that led, to the, you know, led to, the, to the manufacturing partner. But yeah, absolutely, it was, that, was, that was critical. But it was, it was still using, it was still exploiting the, the, this kind of equity that we'd built and actually doing rather than kind of, you know, do it, like just sort of doing it rather than thinking about it and structuring it was actually a much more effective way of, of, uh, of dealing with that, that risk profile. Um, this is them getting produced. I'm going to race a bit through it. This is a launch. These are the first products ever in the country. We launched it in the BFI in 2010. Um, that's the product. We started a category, basically. We, 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 um, you know, we asked the question why a $100 billion industry had failed to actually create a product to inspire people to consume energy more efficiently. We just thought, you know, marketing can't do it. You know, marketing can tell people they should, you know, consume more responsibly, but people don't listen to marketing um, necessarily unless it's done really well. But ultimately, if you don't have a product that excites people, then they ain't going to do it. So anyway, we started it, and it's quite populous now, which, um, you know, which is interesting. And, and obviously, when you're creating a category, you're not just creating a single product. You're creating a category. You're back in this situation again where you don't really have the rules and the precedents don't exist. So, you know, that, and that creates lots of risks because, you know, everything you do is really for the first time in that category. Um, and also, yeah, every time you establish a category, you create all this space for other competitors to sweep in and take, you know, take your, um, you know, take your uh, um, opportunities away. So, uh, obviously, our shelves look very different, you know, with, because we're sort of category leaders in a way. We get to sort of, you know, we're trying to do the same thing as we did with the phone, set the bar high, set the standards high. And, 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 and present ourselves like a you know, proper kind of premium, premium brand. So that's in, uh, that, you know, that's in John Lewis. And trying to make this aspirational, trying to make the, the, the category really mean something. Um, so, so you know, this is obviously, the, 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 again, like the Sinclair example, the kind of the example of when things go bad. So Blockbuster, in kind of in, in denial about the change that was happening around it and, and what the internet was doing for distribution, and how, I think, again, as creative people, we're, we're often trying to drive things forward. We're trying to take our clients forward because we're very receptive and excited about stuff up there. But at the same time, moving feels like fearsome. It feels terrifying. Um, and back, back to that, so much back to that, that, that sort of fear of the unknown. Even if now it's terrible, at least it's a known terrible the thing you're taking me towards could be even more terrible, but worse than that, it's an unknown terrible. And that, that creates this, this uh, you know, incredible kind of inertia. Um, but standing still is obviously not standing still when, you're, when the environment's changing so fast. So it's, you know, and that, therein lies the, the conundrum for us, how, how to lead towards the, you know, towards the change um, in a way that, 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 you know, that deals with this 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 tension. Like how do we you know how do we do that? That's that's the kind of whether we're whether we're conscious of that or not, we're kind of doing it every day if we're if we're doing if we're doing good good stuff. Um, there's just a funny example, the boating at boat face thing, which sets up the next uh, slide about crowdsourcing, which is 
you know, again, if you're if you're a big grown up brand, I've got we 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 ran a Kickstarter for us uh, this this uh, bulb last no, it's actually a couple of years ago now, and a lot of people in the kind of grown up branding world were like, why do you why would you do that? You know, if you're sort of if people think you're successful and you you've got a great brand, like why would you ever throw the doors open and ask people for help? That seems kind of ridiculous. Like, isn't marketing all about trying to create aspiration and put things again back on a pedestal? So I try to aspire towards it or by buying that product, it kind of raises my status and makes me more like that that's sitting up there all, all up on high. And then, but you throw it around, and I, so I, uh, when, I, when I've, oh dear, um, when I've um, uh, responded to those journalists, what I've, what I've always said is, well, look, you know, if you, if you don't ask for help, um, then what you're doing is you're guaranteeing that you're going to have to work so much harder to establish that relationship when, when everything's done and when everything's fixed, rather than letting people in earlier and establishing a deeper relationship. So if you think about market, what's marketing trying to do ultimately? What it's ultimately trying to do is establish relationships with people. So when they go, their hand's going towards the shelf, do they reach that way, do they reach that way? The reason why they're going to go the way that you want them to go is because you have some advantage. That's ultimately about the relationship you have with them and the relationship they have with the brand. Like, what's driving their preference? What's driving their interest? So it's, uh, fundamentally, it's about relationships. So if you, yeah, yeah. If you, um, you know, if you step back from all the different disciplines doing their thing, things, because largely because of the way the world has worked traditionally, and you say, is there maybe a better way of, of establishing these deeper relationships? Then, of course, letting people in and, and seeing the whole kind of machinations of, of, of a business, a product business, a service business and whatnot, as a combination of, you know, transactions and, and you, know, you know, systems and journeys, but equally storytelling, relationship building. You potentially access much more, you know, much more power. Everybody that invested in this, whether, the, whether they love the product or not, it's neither here nor there. Everything we do from here on in, they're on that journey with us. They're part of our business. And they, they have a they have a, an interest that's so much deeper than than um, you know that they would do had we have kind of kept them out and just launched it and then worried about how to create excitement and, and, and relationships. And I don't think any advert on the planet is capable of creating that 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 kind of deep you know empathy and 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 care uh, than inviting people to help and inviting pe people to participate in the business, which is which is which is why we are. Now going onto Crowdcube on the basis of that that uh, that relationship. So we're about to launch two two big product lines, and we just basically need to fund it properly. So again, you know, we've been around, we've talked to lots of different people, we were talking to VCs for a while and all this stuff, and it's just like, actually, what's the most what's the critical thing for this business? It's relationships in the marketplace, out there in in reality, not kind of locked up in a in a in an institution. So we should do the same. That makes perfect sense to us. And this is, you know, this is ultimately about people. So this seems like the logical, the logical way to go. And I think from a, from a, you know, from a risk standpoint, yeah, of course. Again, we, you know, we run that risk of people thinking, well, you know, you, you're coming for, you, you're asking for help. Therefore, that lowers your status. Um, but equally, if we bring in a bunch of people that suddenly are much more kind of invigorated and really care about the prospects of the business, that's surely a much greater you know, much greater position for us to be in. So I think I'll leave it there because I haven't left enough uh, time for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>